Kevin and Ivy, what did you do during the break to connect with nature? Kevin and I sat at the bench next to the lake. We viewed the three short Sadhguru video clips. We also observed the ducks swimming in the lake. I enjoyed seeing the squirrels foraging for food under the trees, and the birds flying in the sky. It was relaxing. I'm happy that both of you know how to enjoy and connect with nature. It is one of the daily activities you should do, in addition to connecting with your inner person. Both activities will provide you the anchor to navigate your lives through the turbulent distractions of the current age of networks. Let us explore the question on what is the inner person. You mean the question mark enclosed by the red circle in the center of the Pekinok logo? Yes, Kevin. We would like to explore first what the ancient texts and mystics views are about the inner person. After that, we shall explore what modern day science have discovered about the inner person. Joanna, I did not know that there is more to know about being aware as a person until I watched the video. Feelings are just visitors by Sadhguru. Let me show you and Kevin a clip from the video on what the Guru says about our awareness levels. There's in many different levels. What you are aware of is all that exists for you. This must be understood. So only what you are aware of exists for you. Right now your awareness is limited to small aspect of your life. Whole aspect of spirituality means to become of aware of everything that you are, so that before you go, you know life, you experience life in its totality, to live totally. To live and to live totally, that's spirituality. So that you know life in all dimensions. You don't go just knowing a little part of your life, you want to know all of it. So if you want to know all of it, how? So awareness is just like this. Right now your energies, your body, your emotion, your mind, everything is fu functioning as a limited voltage. You crank up the voltage, suddenly you start seeing so many things which are not in your experience till that moment. So in a way, to put it very simply, to put it technically, you need to turn up your voltage. Thank you Ivy for the video clip. Yes, there is a lot we do not know about our inner person. That is why it is good for us to keep an open mind and learn as much as we can from both ancient texts that are interpreted by mystics and from modern day scientists. Ivy, can you please share with us the key points from the video clip? Sadhguru says that right now, most of us are limited in our awareness of our inner person. He says that to be spiritual is to be aware of everything that we are and to know life in all its dimensions. He says that right now, most of us are operating in a limited capacity and have to turn up our voltage to operate at maximum capacity. I wonder what the Guru meant by life in all its dimensions? I also wonder what the Guru meant by turn up your voltage to operate at maximum capacity. Ivy, the phrase turn up your voltage is a metaphor used by the Guru to inspire curiosity in the listener to search for the method to know the complete inner person. Ivy and Kevin, let us find out what the ancient texts and mystics have to say about all the dimensions of life. Please search and share one YouTube video clip on the subject of the five koshas. I found a video that explains what are the five koshas and how they are related to modern day science. The five koshas are found in ancient Indian Vedic texts that dates back to 6th century BC. Please see the following clip I extracted from the video. In Vedic spirituality, in the Tatirya Upanishad, written about 6th century BC, there is this notion that your physical being consists of five koshas. The Sanskrit word kosha is sometimes translated as body, but it means pail, bucket, sheath, or simply container. According to the Tatirya Upanishad, your body is made of five koshas, or five containers. Traditionally, the five koshas are named the Anamaya, Pranamaya, Manomaya, Vishnamaya, and Anandamaya kosha. The Anamaya kosha is the physical container or food sheath. This is the physical body of flesh, fluid, and bone. In the Upanishad, it is called the food sheath because it develops from the energy provided by food, and also because when it is dead, it becomes food for other living beings. 
After the Anamaya Kosha is the Pranamaya Kosha. Pranamaya Kosha is the body's prana container. Vedic spirituality, prana means energy, so this container is filled with the vital life force energy. After the Pranamaya Kosha comes the Manomaya Kosha. The Manomaya Kosha is the mind container. This kosha is made up of our basic thoughts and feelings. The Manomaya Kosha also includes aspects of your bodily ego. Uh, we might call the Manomaya Kosha your lower mind kosha. After your lower mind comes the Vijnamaya Kosha. The Vijnamaya Kosha is the container for your discriminating intellect. The Vijnamaya Kosha includes your critical thought functions. Finally, there is the Anandamaya Kosha or bliss container. This is that aspect of your physical being where you purportedly experience connection and the pure bliss of higher consciousness. Now, in the Tatiri Upanishad, the five sheaths are said to fit one inside another. Inside all of them, contained by all of them, is the Atman, Higher Self, or Soul. You cannot be afraid to engage with, update, and modernize the texts you approach. If you engage, update, and modernize, you generate understanding and respect. If you don't, you sow confusion and disrespect. Frankly, the last thing this world needs right now is more confusion than disrespect. Finally, just to restate an obvious point we've already mentioned, if you want to activate your bliss sheath, your bliss systems, your connection systems, take the advice of the ancient Vedic thinkers and pay attention to the health and alignment of your physical body, your life functions, your mind and bodily ego, your higher thinking functions, and your spiritual systems. To all five quotients. The ancient lesson here is quite clear. Your body, your brain, your central nervous system, your bodily ego, and your critical thinking capacities all have to be healthy and aligned for everything to function properly. Only when your koshas are all healthy and aligned can your body properly contain your soul. As we can see, this is not rocket science. It's just ancient common sense. Thank you, Ivy, for sharing with us the very informative and interesting clip. Kevin, please share with us what you have found about the five koshas. I found a short video where Sadhguru explains what are the five koshas. Please see the following video. In the yogic system, we look at the human mechanism like this. There are five dimensions, one inside the other. One is the physical body, which is referred to as the food body, because this is essentially a heap of food that we have gathered over a period of time. The next is known as the mental body because we ascribe intelligence to every cell in the body. There is more memory and intelligence in each molecule of DNA than you can decipher through your brain. That much of intelligence and memory is sitting right here. So this is your hardware, that is your software, but these two things cannot do anything by themselves unless you plug it into quality power. So the third layer of the body is pranamaya kosha. This is the energy body. Now the fourth layer is called as Vigyanamaya Kosha. So whatever you cannot perceive through five senses, if you perceive that, then that is called extraordinary knowledge. The fifth dimension is referred to as Anandamaya Kosha, which literally translates as bliss body. It is purely non-physical in nature. Because it is non-physical, we do not know how to define or describe it. There is no definition to it, there is no description to it. Whenever we touch it, we feel blissed out. Now to enter into this dimension is the whole process of mysticism. Ivy and Kevin, please share what you have learned about the five koshas, or dimensions of life within a person. I did not know that a person can be described as made up of five layers. It is interesting to see that, apart from our external physical body, our inner person can be seen as divided into four more layers. The video clip that I shared tries to remove the mystery of the five layers, 
by updating the terminology of the layers into modern-day physical body systems. They are the physical body, the metabolic life systems in a body, the mental systems that controls the body, the cortical systems of our intellect, and the connection systems. The presenter concludes that to awaken and activate the connection systems, there is a need to pay attention to the health and alignment of the five systems. They are to eat healthy food, exercise and stretch, protect our mind and bodily ego, feed our minds healthy thoughts, and practice critical thinking. I noticed that the presenter defined the bliss layer as a spiritual system, and at the same time defined it as a physical connection system. I think there is a need to clarify what is the bliss layer? Sadhguru says that the bliss layer is non-physical. Thank you Ivy for your summary. Kevin, can you please add to what Ivy just shared about the five layers from Sadhguru's explanations? Yes Joanna. Sadhguru used the term hardware for the parts of our physical body, and software for the mental body. The parts of the body are controlled by the DNA software memory, stored in the cells of our mental body. He says that the hardware and software have to be energized by the energy body, which is the metabolic life systems that Ivy highlighted earlier. He also highlighted the difference between the knowledge body and the mental body. Whatever that we cannot perceive through the five senses of our body, but is able to perceive, that is what he called extraordinary knowledge, and is part of the knowledge body. The five senses of sight, hearing, smell, taste and touch, are parts of the mental body. I think the mental body is analogous to the operating system of a computer. The operating system software and memory functions take care of operating all the hardware parts of the body, processing and storing all the information collected from the five senses. The knowledge body is like the CPU or central processing unit of a computer. The CPU works with the information collected by the five senses and derive new perceptions based on the information. It is the cortical system that I highlighted earlier. Sadhguru says that the bliss body is purely non-physical in nature, and that is why we cannot describe it. He says that to enter into the bliss body dimension is the whole process of mysticism. Thank you Kevin for the summary. Let us see what we have learned so far about the inner person from the five koshas. The physical and energy bodies are our physical body parts, and the metabolic life systems that energized our body parts. We have no problem understanding that. The psychological term for the mental body is the subconscious mind, and the knowledge body is the conscious mind. The term consciousness can be used for the bliss body. We need to understand the three inner bodies of the subconscious mind, conscious mind and consciousness, to be able to know what is the inner person. Kevin and Ivy, please watch the following short video clip, explaining what is the conscious and subconscious mind. I would like you to take note of the key points, so that you can share them in our discussions later. From the time we are born, until we are about the age of seven, the subconscious mind is being programmed to live in the world based on and influenced by factors such as our environment, the people we are around such as our family, and the emotions the environmental factors cause us to experience. Over time, our subconscious mind becomes a storehouse for these experiences or learned behaviors like skills and beliefs, to form what we call our memory. It is a knowledge base that is home to everything we know. But we have to become aware of this knowledge before we can store it in our memory. And we do that with our conscious mind. All of these experiences we have experienced consciously with our conscious mind before being stored in the subconscious, and any time we need to access or reference that information, we use the conscious mind. Here is another way to look at it. Your subconscious mind is like a book of you. Everything you have ever experienced, along with the thoughts and emotions that come with those experiences, have been written down in this book. The book by itself is stagnant. Without the thinking aspects of who you are to actively flip through the book and realize the information inside, the book has no use. What's a book without a reader? This is where the conscious mind comes into play. Your conscious mind is the author and the reader of your book. It is the one who becomes aware of experiences and stores the information learned from them inside of the book. It is also the one who references the information that is already inside to respond to experiences. It is the actively thinking part of your mind, while the subconscious is the storehouse for the information that gives rise to thought. In other words, 
it's like the conscious mind is the thinker and the subconscious mind is the information that gives rise to thought. Without the conscious mind here to think these thoughts, the information stored in our subconscious is meaningless. And without the subconscious mind there to store the information, there are no thoughts for the conscious mind to think. Without the subconscious there to store information, there is only the conscious mind to be aware of the moment, but not to take anything away from it. When we are younger, we are much more active with our conscious mind as we try to fill up the memory space in our subconscious. But as we get older, we tend to rely more heavily on our subconscious program to operate in our daily lives. For example, when you learn to ride a bicycle for the first time, your conscious mind was extremely engaged in the activity because you were just learning how to do this. But now, when you go to hop on a bike, you do so with very little thought required. This is because when you learn how to ride for the first time, that information was stored in your subconscious so that you don't have to relearn to ride a bike every time you get on one. Your conscious mind was responsible for learning that behavior or skill, and your subconscious mind was responsible for storing that learned knowledge. You have been subconsciously programmed to ride a bike, and you now operate on that program when you ride one. By operating on that program, you free up your conscious mind to focus on things like the surrounding traffic to further ensure your safety. The conscious mind and the subconscious mind are separate aspects of our mind, but they work together. These two powerful forces working together, and specifically the amount of information that can be stored in our subconscious mind, is what makes us humans such a powerful and advanced species. Kevin, please share with us the key points from the video. I learned that our subconscious mind is programmed from the time of our birth till seven years old, by the people and environment around us. We experience and store the emotions and values that our environment gives us. Our subconscious mind stores all our skills and beliefs. It is our knowledge base and is the home of everything we know. We are literally being programmed from birth by our environment. This reminds me of Jeff, the grad student in the Gamified Life video we discussed earlier on the topic, The World is a Stage for the Game of Life. Yes Ivy. We shall discuss this later when we see the video clip interview with Bruce Lipton on the power of the mind. The presenter uses the metaphor of a book for the subconscious mind, and a reader for the conscious mind. The subconscious mind provides the information that gives rise to thought in the conscious mind. The presenter also used the metaphor of a horse for the subconscious mind, and a rider for the conscious mind. The conscious mind is the learner, and the subconscious mind stores all the information that is learned. That is why it takes time for us to consciously learn a new skill or habit, like how to ride a bike. However, once we have learned it or programmed it into our subconscious mind, the subconscious mind can work in the background without us being conscious or aware of its workings. I wonder what happens when the subconscious mind acts like an untamed horse, sending information to the conscious mind in an uncontrolled way, to create all kinds of thoughts and emotions. The conscious mind will then have a tough time, Yes, Ivy. Sadhguru has highlighted this issue in the video. How do you stop the mind's chatter? Let us see an extract from the video. Sadhguru, uh, I wanted to know that uh, when we are silent, still we feel that mind chattery, which always bothers us, how to get rid of it. If you're having a mental di diarrhea, you are obviously consumed something wrong. What, what this wrong thing could be is, the moment you identify yourself with something that you are not, then you're finished. Your mind is a continuous runs. There is no other way. Do what you want. Try as hard as you want. It is not going to stop. If you do not identify yourself with anything that you are not, you know how to be with everything, you know how to use everything, but you're not identified with it, then you will see if you sit here, simply mind will be like this. You want to use it, you can use it, otherwise it will be like this. Right now your hands are like this, or you're holding it tied up because it will go all over, is it? No. You can keep it like this. You can keep it like this, you can keep it like this. When you want to use it, you can use it. So it's a useful instrument. Suppose your hands become like this. If it becomes like this, you will become ridiculous, isn't it? 
If it happens to your mind, also you are equally ridiculous. It is just that you are living in the comfort that nobody else can see it. But people can see it and whether they can see it or not, that's not the point. The issue is the most important faculty in your life is out of control, doing its own rubbish all the time. If you sit here, if you're not identified with this and with this, then you will see everything is just fine. Then your mind will do what you want it to do. Otherwise it will simply hang there and that's how it should be. Mind should not be telling its own stories all the time. It should tell the story that you want it to tell, isn't it? Otherwise it's quite a nuisance. Kevin, can you please share with us the key points from the video? Sadhguru says that the reason why a person cannot stop the constant chattering of thoughts in their mind is because they have identified themselves with something that they are not. In the video he uses his hand to represent the conscious mind and the body to represent the subconscious mind. He uses his hand to illustrate what it means to have control over a person's conscious mind. He showed through his hand gestures that if a person is not identified with their subconscious and conscious minds, then they will be able to have control over the thoughts in their mind. If the conscious and subconscious minds are like mental tools that we can control, then the guru must be referring to consciousness, or the bliss layer body, as the one that should be in control of the two minds. I understand now what the guru meant by thinking consciously in the video, feelings are just visitors. Please see the short extract from the video on this issue. Your thinking means, you are exercising your thought process consciously, isn't it? Yes? Thinking means you are doing something consciously. Right now this is in a state of mental diarrhea, it's just pouring all the time. Now, what is negative about it, what is positive about it, what is negative is, it's happening unconsciously, that is what is negative, not the content. You thought about a devil, that's negative, you thought about a god that is positive, there's no such thing. It, the most negative thing that's happening right now is it's happening unconsciously. That is what is negative about it. So there is no such thing as negative and positive thought. Either it's a conscious thought or it's a diarrhea. So, how to stop this? This is the first thing you must do. You identified yourself with something that you are not. Now you can't stop your thought process, do what you want. You do any mantra you want, think of any god you want, do whatever the hell you want. The moment you identify yourself with something that you are not, you cannot stop your mind. Thank you Kevin and Ivy for your sharing and interesting highlights. Let us get the modern scientific views on the conscious and subconscious minds from Dr. Bruce Lipton. Please see the following video. We have to recognize that what we call the mind is actually two separate minds, and each mind learns in a different way, and that's where the problems come from. So let's talk about the conscious mind. That's the latest evolution of the brain. It's right behind your forehead, a lobe of brain called prefrontal cortex. This is where our personal identity is. This is where our spiritual connection is, the prefrontal cortex. Consciousness character is creative. This is what makes humans different than lower animals. We can have imagination and then we can create from our imagination. What is it you want? Oh, I can make that. So that gives us our power. Subconscious is actually just a database of programs, like the hard drive of a computer. There's nobody in there. So conscious mind is creative, subconscious mind is habits, habitual. Subconscious records a behavior and then can play it back. You learned how to walk before you were two. You could be a hundred years old, you're still walking, why? Because the program that I got in subconscious can be there a hundred years. But if the programs aren't good, you have to remember this is the habit mind. Habits do not want to change. If a habit changes, then it's not a habit anymore. But that creates an issue then. What if my programs that I don't want and I want to change them? I go, oh, well, it learns in a different way than the conscious mind. 
Conscious Mind's creative. You could read a self-help book. You can uh, watch this video. Uh, you can go to a lecture. You can just go, aha, I have a new idea. And Conscious Mind can change. Subconscious resists change because if it changes, then habits disappear. This is why people read a self-help book and if you give them a test, they, they can get 100. I understood everything in the book. I say, did your life change? No, but I understand everything in the book. And I go, that's because conscious mind downloaded that information. But conscious mind only working 5% of the time means I don't care what you read in the book, your subconscious is still controlling it. Ivy and Kevin, please share what you have learned from Dr. Lipton about the conscious and subconscious mind. According to Dr. Lipton, the conscious and subconscious mind learn in a different way. Because of this, we have a problem. The subconscious mind is a habit mind and cannot change quickly. When the conscious mind decides to learn something, it will not become a part of the subconscious mind until it is programmed into it as a habit. Dr. Lipton says that the conscious mind is represented by the prefrontal cortex in the brain. He says that it is where our personal identity and spiritual connections are located. He says that our conscious mind is working only 5% of the time. 95% of the time our subconscious mind is in control of our thoughts and behaviors. Joanna, I don't understand why our conscious mind is working only 5% of the time. Ivy, the reason is because of our unconscious thinking habit that allows our subconscious mind to take control, while we are lost in thoughts. Let us see the following video clip where Dr. Lipton explains how this takes place. We have to understand during development, the brain is the equivalent of a computer. So in addition to the operating system, you also need programs to start up the machine. Well, the human brain is like this computer. And the beginning part is it's got an operating system. So now the brain is going to work, but it doesn't have any programs. So nature creates the first seven years of a child's life to download programs so that once you have the programs, then you can use the brain as the computer. So the first seven years of a child's life, the brain is not functioning at the vibration of consciousness. And I mean that when you put wires on a person's head, it's called electroencephalograph, EEG. I could read your brain activity. A child below seven has a vibration of the brain that's less than conscious. It's called theta. When theta is controlling behavior, it's imagination. This is why children under seven mix the real world and the imaginary world together because that's theta. So a tea party where they take a teapot with nothing and pour it into the cup with nothing and then they drink the nothing and they go, oh, that was so wonderful, the tea. Uh, that is a child using theta, imagination. But theta is also hypnosis. And I say, so why is this important? Because you can't give an infant a book and say, study the rules of how to be a member of a family. Study the rules of how to be a member of a community. Thousands of rules. So how does a child get a chance to learn? It's not even able to read. And the answer is, it doesn't have to because the brain is in theta, which is hypnosis. So it watches the mother and the father and the siblings. It watches the community and whatever it sees is downloaded just like a video recorder. Watch my mother, watch my father. See how they did it? I record that. Now I have a program. So for the first seven years, we download behavior but from other people. And the problem is this, most of their program behavior is not very positive. In fact, up to 70% of the programs that we downloaded by watching other people are disempowering or self-sabotaging or limiting beliefs. So we're actually downloading programs that are not helping us. And this goes into the subconscious. So the subconscious is like a hard drive in a computer. It's got programs, okay? And the conscious mind is the creator, like the one that types on the keyboard. Conscious mind is wishes and desires. That's what you want from your life. Health, happiness, good relationship, good job. Conscious mind, creative. But it turns out that 95% of our life, our conscious mind is not typing on the keyboard, it's thinking. So it's thinking about what happened yesterday, what's gonna happen tomorrow, what should I be doing, thinking. When I'm thinking, Conscious mind is not paying attention to the outside. Conscious mind has gone inside. So all the thinking you're doing is actually taking you away from the world that you see. 
well, what if I'm driving the car and I have a thought? And I say, conscious mind, let's go with the steering wheel. And it's just thinking. I say, well, what about the car? And I go, subconscious is autopilot. So the moment you let go of the wheel with your conscious mind, subconscious comes in, but it has the programs and knows how to drive, but learned all these things. But the problem is this, it's programs mainly from other people. Is the program good? Fine, no problem. But if the program is a negative problem, it could sabotage your life and you are not even seeing it because you're inside thinking, okay? So all of a sudden it becomes a very important issue and that is, what are your subconscious programs? Dr. Lipton has confirmed what Sadhguru said in the earlier video about unconscious thinking. A person can be lost in thought about what happened yesterday and what is going to happen tomorrow. When consciousness is lost inside thought, it is not paying attention to the outside. The subconscious mind will then take over and implement its habitual programming. Dr. Lipton says that if the subconscious programs are bad, then they will sabotage our life without us even seeing it because we are lost inside our thoughts. I think I understand now what Sadhguru meant by not identifying with something that we are not. Our conscious and subconscious minds are not us. Our consciousness should be observing the activities of our conscious and subconscious minds. Kevin, we are not the operating system and CPU software of our bodies. We should be conscious and mindful of our actions, including of our bad thinking habits. Ivy and Kevin, I'm happy that both of you now have some understanding of the relationships between the three different layers of an inner person. Let us listen to Dr. Lipton's recommendation in the following video clip. You stay conscious and that means mindful. I say, why is it important? Because if, remember, the reason I play the program is because my thinking uh, went inside and then the program played automatically. But if I stop thinking, I'm not letting go of the wheel and conscious mind has wishes and desires. So guess what? If I'm holding onto the wheel with conscious mind, I'm driving toward wishes and desires. And that's what manifests as the honeymoon effect. Unfortunately, thinking comes back in and then the old programs come back up and then the honeymoon ends for most people. But the most important lesson was this. If we rewrote all the stupid programs and just left the creative ones that we want, then life would be a honeymoon every day of your life for as long as you lived. We'd have heaven on earth. But it's the programs that get in the way. So the wake up call is, it's time to wake up, change the programming, change civilization, because if civilization starts to live in harmony, the planet will regrow the garden that we were given when we got here. Ivy and Kevin, please highlight the key points from the video. Dr. Lipton says that if we are not thinking, our consciousness will be holding the driving wheel of our life, and we can then direct it towards our wishes and desires. Unfortunately, most of us are born mentally crippled with a habit of unconscious thinking. It is very easy for us to fall into unconscious thinking, and then the old bad subconscious program will come back. Joanna, if we can reprogram our habit of unconscious thinking, then our consciousness will be in control of the conscious mind for more than 5% of the time. Dr. Lipton's recommendation is for us all to wake up, so that we can change the programming of our subconscious mind. He says that in this way we will be able to change human civilization. If human civilization can live in harmony, he says that the planet will be able to regenerate into a garden again. The wake-up call is especially important for parents with young kids, since they are responsible for the programming of the kids' subconscious minds in the first seven years of their life. Yes, Kevin and Ivy. Both of you are correct. According to Dr. Lipton, changing the consciousness of a person will also change the biology of their genetics. We shall see some videos and discuss this topic after we see the following video where Dr. Lipton gives his advice on conscious parenting. The wonderful story about this new, new science is that programming is what creates our life and parents are programmers. And so if parents knew that their words that they say to a child are shaping the future of that child, then parents would start to say different things to their children instead of criticizing them saying that's not good enough and you don't deserve this and who do you think you are? 
the conventional parent is criticizing a child like a coach on a team. If a player on the team isn't doing well, what does the coach say? He doesn't go, oh, please do better. The coach says, that's not good enough. You can do better. But a child old enough to understand what the coach is talking about goes, oh, yeah, okay, I'm not working so hard. I'll work better. And criticism makes them change. But remember, a child under seven is not thinking. It's just recording. What is it here? Not good enough, not worthy, not lovable, not deserving. And, and that was because the parents were gonna do that to try to make the child do better. But if the child is not conscious thinking and just recording, then all those words become very negative programs for the future of that child. It's more effective for parents to say, you are smart, you can do anything, you're very powerful, you're a creator. Why? Because if those are the programs, and then the child's life is 95% from those programs, all of those programs give power to a child. So there's an important part, it's called conscious parenting. But then now you gotta add one last thing. Parents are like everybody else. 5% of their life comes from their conscious wishes and 95% comes from the program. I say, why is that important? Because a parent was once a child and was programmed by their parent. So when they're with their own child, 5% of the time they're gonna be, oh, I'm gonna be a wonderful conscious parent. I'm gonna make the best child possible. But I go, yeah, but 95% you're still automatic program. You're gonna play the same program that your parents had. A very interesting little side story. When they followed the fate of children who were adopted into a family where there was cancer running in the family, so the whole family lineage, grandparents, parents, et cetera, had cancer, and a child from outside adopted into that family, it turns out that the adopted child will generally get the same cancer that the family has. But the most important insight is the adopted child came from different genetics. So it's not the same genes. So where did the cancer come from? And the answer is not from the genes, but from the programming. So we have to recognize, I want to be a conscious parent, but I also recognize that 95% of my life is not coming from a conscious parent, it's coming from program. But if there's, a, let's say, a couple that are raising a child, one of the parents could observe the other parent. <laughs> And if the other parent goes off and starts doing an old program, the watching parent can go, wait, let's stop and change this program. And so between the parents watching each other and helping them change the program, they can become then real conscious parents. And so this is why it's important because like Bill, he couldn't see his own behavior. A parent cannot see their own behavior. They have wishes to be the best parent, but that's 5%. 95% is coming from just the way they were raised. But another parent observing this has an opportunity to be critical and help adjust the programming so that if both parents are doing this, at some point they will rewrite the negative programming and then become truly conscious parents and creating the next generation with power. Thank you, Joanna, for the video. Parents are programmers and they program the way their kids will live their life when they grow up. They have a big responsibility to fulfill. Dr. Lipton says that conscious parenting requires both parents to work as a team to observe each other, since it is very easy for a parent to fall back to their unconscious habitual behavior. I wonder what else Dr. Lipton has discovered about consciousness and its impacts on our lives. Yes, Ivy. Let us see the following videos on consciousness and its relationship to our genetics. A gene is a blueprint to make a body part called a protein. So the body is comprised of 100,000 or more different proteins to give us this structure. And the genes are blueprints to make them. Well, the problem is you have over 100,000 proteins, but you only have 20,000 genes. All of a sudden, the belief that one gene makes one protein was completely false. Because epigenetics reveals that for every gene in your body, you can create 3,000 different variations. 
So basically it led from genes controlling life to environment controlling genes, then to nervous system controlling the environment, which then led to mind controlling the nervous system. And so my evolution took me from uh, the genes to the role of the mind, and that the mind is the absolute control of our biology. To understand the nature, what is the difference between genetics and epigenetics? When I say this character, this disease is under genetic control, that is the belief that genes turn on and off and made the disease. This makes us a victim because as far as we know, we didn't pick the genes. And if you don't like your genes, you can't change the genes. And then you hear that the genes turn on and off by themselves. Then you realize I, I'm just a, like a time bomb. <laughs> and one day the gene goes boom, and then I get cancer. I'm a victim. But the new science, epigenetics, which means control above the genes, which turns out to be environment, but our perception of the environment is what controls the genes. I say, well, if perception and environment control genes, we as individuals, we can control our environment and we can control our perceptions. So if we can control those things, then by definition, we control our genetics. And all of a sudden it says, then we're not victims, but we're masters of our genetic activity. Now we know from epigenetics, consciousness, lifestyle, belief systems, these are the ultimate controls of the gene. We know that if you've got a cancer gene and that's what you believe, then you think I'm gonna get the cancer, and then you get a cancer and you say the genes did it, and now we know, no, that there is no cancer gene. There is not one gene that causes cancer. Genes are correlated with cancer, meaning if your life is not in harmony and you have one of these genes, you can activate a cancer. 50% of the women that have the same BRCA1 gene never get the cancer. The point is very important. Having the gene doesn't mean you get cancer, but having the gene and not living in harmony, not living in a healthy lifestyle, that causes the cancer. And so we have to help people take them from the belief I'm a victim and give them the science that no, your consciousness is creating this life experience in here. Your consciousness is controlling your genes. Ivy and Kevin, please share what you have learned from the videos. I learned that a gene is a blueprint to make a body part. I also learned that a person's perception and the environment control genes. Since our consciousness controls perception, it means that we can control how our genes behave. Science has shown that our mind controls our biology. Dr. Lipton says that having a cancer gene does not mean a person will get cancer, but having the gene and not living a healthy, harmonious lifestyle can activate the cancer gene. Now I understand what Sadhguru meant in the video on overcoming anxiety, when he says that we can create a new physiological and psychological process in our body, if we can take charge of our consciousness. Please see the video clip. If your mind took instructions from you, would you create anxiety? No. So don't look for answers elsewhere, elsewhere, elsewhere. It is just that your own physiology and your psychological patterns not taking instructions from you. Now, there may be many factors, there may be genetic factors, there may be sociological factors, there may be growing up issues, you know, various things. But do not ascribe your problems to any of those things. The important thing is just this, you are not able to have your mind the way you want it. That's the only problem you have, isn't it? The moment you ascribe it, I'm like this because my father was like that, I'm like this because my grandfather's genetics were not okay, you're finished because we can't change those guys now. Yes. You can't choose a different father or a different grandfather now, it's over. But you can transform this, you must understand. Still, it doesn't matter you have anxiety disorder. Still, if you put a piece of carrot, there is an intelligence here which can transform a carrot into a human being. That means every day a new body is being manufactured within you, isn't it? 
in parts, a new human being is manufactured every day. When the very source of creation is functioning within you and a new human being is constantly being created, if you take little charge of that, you can create an entire new physiological and psychological process. Yes, Ivy, the guru is correct. The science of epigenetics and consciousness that we have just discussed have shown us that we can overcome the negative psychological programming from our first seven years of life and also our genetic heritage. What we need to do is to learn to live our life in a conscious way. Joanna, what does Sadhguru meant when he says that the physiology and psychological patterns are not taking instructions from you? Ivy, the you that the guru is referring to is the consciousness layer person. The anxiety and health issues of the person are caused by the subconscious mind, feeding negative thoughts to the conscious thinking mind. If the thinking mind is not under the control of consciousness, it will be unable to stop the constant chattering thoughts that the subconscious mind feeds it. This creates the anxiety state in a person and all related health issues arising from it. Joanna, what does the guru meant when he says that every day a new body is being manufactured within us? Kevin, according to Dr. Lipton, our body is made up of a living community of 50 trillion cells that are controlled by the messages sent by the brain. Unlike a lifeless object like a toy car, a living being is constantly being regenerated every day. That is what the guru meant when he says a new body is being created every day. You can use the link at the end of this video to understand more. I would like to conclude this video by showing the similarity of the five layers of a person with the different parts of a remote control toy car. The boy controlling the toy car remotely can be seen as the equivalent of the consciousness layer person controlling the other four layers. The issue is that the consciousness layer person is not in control 95% of the time. In part three of this video series, we shall learn more about the consciousness layer and how we can increase the level of our consciousness when we are going about our daily lives.